Today we are talking about a series that has been around in discussion for most of 2018, and it's one I've held a variety of opinions on. Before it even aired, I was expecting a below average Eureka 7 clone starring Anemone with a romance partner too dense to stand straight. Funny comparison considering Anemone got her own Eureka 7 movie just last month, but what can you do? Then, after watching the first three episodes, I was quite impressed by the world building of this show, though confused at how you properly pronounce the show's title, Fran X, Frank, Franks, I don't know. But ultimately, I predicted that the show would be a fan service romp a la Kill la Kill with few redeeming elements, but enough of a fan base and controversy to keep it in public discourse for most of the year. I was at least somewhat right thanks to that last part. Controversy is probably too strong of a word though, as the series we are talking about today is full of relationship drama, and when all is said and done, it really just boils down to an overblown best girl showdown. Really though, they all ignored the real best girl here. But I'm not one who backs down from controversy, for today we are talking about what I found to be one of the most entertaining dramas of the year and what has become one of my favorite shows from two separate production houses. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and today on Glass Reflection, we are discussing Darling in the Franks. Let's jam. Darling in the Franks is a 24-episode series produced in early 2018 as an almost unprecedented collaboration between A1 Pictures and Studio Trigger, helmed by director Atsushi Nishigori. It takes place in Earth's distant future. Humanity has moved to a more fantastical kind of molten energy, mined from the deep underground to power all sorts of futuristic technology. However, in doing so, it drew the ire of the Kalaxosaurs, a kind of blue morphing monster species who appeared seemingly out of nowhere in response to humanity's drilling and drastically changed how humans live. Traditional cities have been laid to waste and the remnants of society have taken to mobile domed cities that traverse the landscape. These domes all house a squadron of mecha soldiers piloted by male-female pairs of teenagers raised specifically for this purpose and not much else. They don't have regular lives, regular families, or regular hopes and dreams. They don't know how relationships work. They don't even know what a kiss is. Their purpose is to pilot the mechs and defeat the threat. With no pubescent drama whatsoever. Yeah, we'll come back to that. One of these children, a boy named Hiro, finds himself incapable of piloting the Franks. His connection to any partner is weak and unstable, and since this is the one thing he was raised to do, his self-worth is in the dumpster, and his whole existence is called into question. Until that cliched, faithful day arrives when he meets Zero Two. Zero Two is an enigma. She's a demon-looking girl with red horns who shows up with an entourage and seems capable of piloting a mech all on her own without the need of a partner. However, she takes a liking to Hiro and eventually invites him in the heat of battle to join her, combine with her to fight in her mech to become her darling. You can imagine Hiro being ecstatic by this. Suddenly he has purpose again. He can pilot a Franks like he always thought he would. Suddenly all is right with the world until it isn't. Being partners with Zero Two is not a simple affair. She's not quite human. She's not quite monster, either. She doesn't follow the rules or norms that Hiro and his squad mates have come to expect out of pilots, and then when rumors that all of Zero Two's previous partners ended up dead comes to light, friction begins to develop in the group. This is what drives the show's narrative. I'm going to allow myself one Evangelion comparison to this project, being to me the one that matters the most in trying to describe this series to newcomers. It is very open in how you wish to interpret things. So much about the setting can be interpreted in whatever way you wish. The character designs, the mecha and their fighting style, the messed up situations the characters find themselves in. But if you can get past at least some of that, there might be, in this pile of confusion and multitudes of ideas, a story worth watching. Though, 
it's hard to really nail down what this series is trying to do, what story it is trying to tell, and for a number of reasons. For much of its narrative, Darling in the Franks is about adolescent fighting, relationships that start and stop, pride filling in for purpose, and most importantly, love and all of its different possible forms. Much of the entertainment to be gained here was from the interpersonal drama of a group of friends forced together with new additions to their social hierarchy and their own biological development barging in and making it difficult for each of them to really know what they want or how to properly express their feelings to one another. The show spends a lot of time on feelings of envy, jealousy, and forging your own path because those with more experience aren't around to guide them or those who can just flat out refuse to for one reason or another. This is of course all set up in a wrapping of beautifully animated mecha battles against an unknown dangerous force which seems to threaten all life on the planet as this sort of thing tends to do. As well as the struggle that the characters are placed into by superiors who don't seem to really care all that much about them at all beyond what a textbook might describe as empathy. The children are treated as weapons with their bodies and emotions merely tools that can be molded and forced into a mecha for some grand purpose, some grand plan. One of the things that I really liked early on was a focus more on the immediate questions of what is happening between the characters rather than trying to examine the big picture. We get hints of the larger human society that exists separate from the children, but it's more of an afterthought to the narrative, a piece of window dressing in the narrative setting to help make the scenario feel more lived in and, and thought out. It allows you to speculate and fill in the gaps with your own imagination and possibilities while the show itself is handling the more in-your-face conflicts of the characters. The only downside to this method of world building is when the narrative suddenly decides that it's necessary to look behind the curtain and attempt to explain what is happening in the world and why, but it never happens in a way that satisfies. This of course happens here. The enjoyment I got out of this series was with the characters, seeing them problem solve with the challenges of interacting with one another and how they react to the circumstances they found themselves in. There was what seemed to be so much thought put into their conflicts that even when their decisions at times became questionable, I could always see how they came to that decision even if I didn't agree with it. There was, I think, only one time I thought the interpersonal relationships came to a situation that seemed contrived, but largely a lot of their conflicts with one another had seeds placed early on and a narrative path to resolve them that felt natural. That's not to say that it's all sunshine and sakura petals. I'm not going to mince words here. There came a point where a lot of the interesting questions I thought the series was asking eventually stopped mattering. There came a time in the series where the narrative takes the situation you thought was happening and flips it on its head. It's almost like they decided to have a Gainax ending to the series, but implemented it five to six episodes early, only to then try to somehow pick up the pieces for a finale. I'm not gonna sit here and claim like I know the cause of this change. There has been rampant speculation since the finale aired back in the summer, and even before that. The series had a bunch of production issues, stemming mostly from the fact that the show started as some quasi-joint production between Trigger, A1, and Studio Cloverworks, which at the time was still closely attached to A1 prior to their separation last October. Needless to say, the final arc of the series, without spoiling it, of course, took some, shall we say, interesting steps. As I mentioned, the show up until that point had spent so much time exploring deep concepts into relationships and expanded upon those concepts with different kinds of interesting questions and situations. But the final arc seemed to put all of that interesting development to the wayside in favor of a more action-oriented plot, one that in my mind was poorly conceived. Like, I understand what they were probably going for, as a more action-oriented, dramatic build-up for the final episode gives a much better sense of finality to the narrative. It just involved disregarding everything that had made this series good. It dragged a bunch of things out over the last few episodes in a way that I didn't feel added anything to the story that they were telling up until that point. This is a narrative end that in no way lived up to the story that preceded it. Now, with my philosophy being the ending is paramount, here are my final thoughts. The action 
for most of the series is fantastic. The musical tracks are far better than I was expecting, and up until that final turn, I was sitting back thinking that even the worst misstep of the show was quite a bit better than the slop I thought the show was going to be on the onset. But in the end, while the build-up to the final moments of the series was a bit cliché, lackluster, and a complete disregard of everything that made the series good, the actual final moments of this show. The last few scenes were different. As a ending point for the cast and the final moments of the relationship between Hiro and Zero Two, it's quite bittersweet. It's not what I was hoping for in an ending, but I still accept it. For, as sad as it was, the ending struck me as profoundly beautiful. But ultimately, I can't say that this series is something that I would recommend to a large amount of people. This kind of drama calls for a particular kind of person, especially considering how it all plays out. I can only tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy it when it comes out. I'm going to put it on my shelf, and I'm going to look at it fondly. Not because I think that this show qualifies as the best of the best. After its change in course? Yeah, no, it doesn't. But for me, this is a series that far surpassed my expectations, even if it fell so much on its face by the end of it. It was one of those times I was so wrong in how I thought I would enjoy the series. So I need the reminder. Because the relationship between all of the main cast was something that I heavily enjoyed watching. And perhaps you will too. Thank you for spending the time to watch this video on Darling and the Franks. I hope you enjoyed it. There will be links down in the description for you to watch the series in the locations from which it is available. Funimation for dub and Crunchyroll for sub. For alternate anime recommendations, if you liked the interpersonal relationships between our characters and want to see another series that has a focus like that, you cannot do better than with Shinsuka Yori from the New World. That'll be right up your alley. I did a video on it last year and I highly recommend it. My second recommendation is hard, mostly because I want to cover the action from Franks, but all the recent options that come to my mind as proper comparisons won't do you better. So I'm going back, back to classic Gynax, and I'm telling you to go watch Gunbuster, if you have not already. Try to watch the OVA series, even if it is harder to find because it is the better telling of the story. But if you cannot, then the film is still perfectly serviceable. In between those two, I hope you find something to your liking. Lastly, a very special thank you to my patrons, who not only support my work in general, but allow me to continue to do what I do, I love and appreciate you all. Specifically though, as I am wont to do, I want to give special shout outs to patrons, Rifen Bonaparte, Rune Jacobson, Devin North, Joshua Garcia, Calhoun Boy, Siri Yamiko, and Victor Eckmark for being especially awesome. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime and stay frosty.